Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Thank you for joining us on this Friday. Joe is off this morning. We're, of course, going to begin with the latest on the Israel-Hamas war. Our team is tracking the newest developments from the Middle East to here at home in Washington. We are going to get started with Jay Gray in Tel Aviv and Aaron Gilchrist in Washington. Good morning to the both of you, Jay. I'll start with you there on the ground. So Israel's defense minister met with troops and told them specifically they will be seeing Gaza soon, quote, from the inside. This is after two weeks of airstrikes pummeling Gaza. Does it seem as though this ground offensive that has been anticipated, we've been watching for as these troops amass, is actually going to begin sometime soon? Do we know what it could look like? Yeah, there are some key indicators, and I can tell you we just learned in the last few minutes that now Israeli defense forces are carrying out uh, some raids in areas along the fence line with Gaza and do believe that there are still Hamas operatives on the Israeli side. So they are clearing the path there with those raids. It would appear for those ground troops to move in. We know that overnight into the day today, the ITF has said uh, that the pace of attacks in the region in Gaza is more than they've seen in decade and that those forces on the ground are, and these are their words, preparing for the next phase. That next phase would look like uh, thousands of troops on the ground uh, moving in along with all of the equipment that's been amassed there, uh, a lot of tanks that would roll initially into the area. And we're talking about combat in the streets now of Gaza. That's something uh, that a lot of people have been very concerned about over the last few days. But it does, again, appear like that uh, ground assault is getting much closer at this time. Aaron, let's bring you in here again from Washington, because last night we saw this rare primetime address, the president only for the second time, speaking from the Oval Office this time about the ongoing war, of course, uh, as well as what's going on in Ukraine, multiple wars. What kind of warning did the president have for Israel ahead of this potential military escalation that Jay just laid out? Well, Savannah, this speech was largely geared toward the American people. The president trying to explain why he felt the Congress needs to support his efforts to support both Ukraine and Israel. There was also going to be some money in this uh, funding uh, request for uh, efforts in Taiwan as well. But but the president took the time during this speech to also talk about the, the conflict that is growing, as Jay just laid out, in Israel and in Gaza. And he wanted to make sure that he referenced 9-11, as he has in previous speeches, speeches over the last two weeks. He referenced uh, the United States uh, sort of going into that that conflict. You'll remember that term shock and awe was something that we heard uh, going into the in invasion of Iraq in 2003. The president wanted to caution the Israelis about uh, going into this conflict with Hamas full of rage. I want you to hear a little bit of what the president said last night. The United States remains committed to the Palestinian people it's right to dignity and to self-determination. As hard as it is, we cannot give up on peace. We cannot give up on a two-state solution. When America experienced the hell of 9-11, we felt enraged as well. While we sought and got justice, we made mistakes. So I caution the government of Israel not to be blinded by rage. At the same time, Savannah, the president is asking, as you noted, for more than $100 billion in funding for these uh, conflicts that are happening in other parts of the world. And during his speech, he, he tried to make the case to Americans by saying that uh, America is what American leadership is what holds the world together. Savannah? Jay, let's talk about this bombing that we're seeing in southern Gaza. The reason that's key, of course, is that's the area that Israel told Palestinians that live in the north. That's where that military presence is amassing at the border. They told those Palestinians to flee to the south. What is the latest on the situation inside the besieged strip as so many people are just taking refuge in this particular part? And what about that aid that is supposed to finally be heading in today? Yeah, and you speak of people taking refuge. 500 or so were in a Greek Orthodox church that was hit by an airstrike. And we know at least 18 have died as a result of that. There is believed to be uh, dozens more covered in the rubble from that strike that happened just this morning. Uh, what the IDF has said is that they're going to continue their attacks wherever Hamas may be. And they are continuing, uh, like we talked about earlier, airstrikes at, at an unprecedented pace, hundreds 
overnight, including this church that was damaged and a church that was a temporary home for all of those who had made that trip uh, to the south. As for the aid, right now it's going nowhere. We know that Israel and Egypt have agreed to allow the aid to flow. Work continues to be done on the roadways on the Gaza side of the Rafa border crossing with Egypt after some damage from those bombing runs. The UN Secretary General today speaking about the issue said it needs to get in its, and I'm quoting here, the difference between life and death for so many people in Gaza, two million who are waiting and have been waiting for more than two weeks for some of these deliveries, food, water, medicine. They could roll tomorrow, according to those on the ground, but at this point, we haven't seen UN administrators or anyone there to uh, watch over that process. All right, Jay Gray, Aaron Gilchrist, thank you very much for kicking us off this hour. Staying with our coverage of this story, nightly news anchor Lester Holt spoke with Americans inside Gaza and Israel who have been deeply impacted by the ongoing violence. American Emily Rauschenberger grew up in the U.S. She and her husband, who's Palestinian, and their children are inside Gaza. They were visiting family when the Israeli retaliation strikes began against Hamas. During the, the days, we have uh, no drinkable tap water. We have to go find it outside in uh, other, other sources. Uh, bread is very hard to get. Whenever it gets dark, you stay inside completely and you hear bombings near and far. Um, so it's just been kind of hard to survive really has the level of bombing decreased at all no the night before there was we saw five apartments targeted and bombed in our again in the neighborhood we live in uh and we don't know we don't know who might be be next really do you want to get uh, out of gaza yes i do i would like very much with my kids to go her message for israel there needs to be a ceasefire and this is just a humanitarian Disaster. At the same time, what would your message be to Hamas? What, what could Hamas do to ease tensions and make this safer? I don't have a good answer to that question. I haven't been able to follow any news um, much at all since we don't have regular internet. You know, for both both sides, there has to be a ceasefire and, and aid and help to the people who are suffering most under this um, bombardment. But suffering doesn't recognize borders, misery, or depth of loss. From inside Israel, what Abby Own, also an American, wants is accountability. From my priority, the first thing that has to happen before any aid goes in is that the hostages are released and come home to their families. The Israeli military upped the number of those believed held hostage by Hamas in Gaza up to 203. That number does not include Owen's aunt Carmela and Carmela's granddaughter Noya, who kidnapped by Hamas terrorists have now been confirmed dead. Their bodies found inside Gaza. Three other family members are still missing, including 12-year-old Erez, captured on video being led away during the attacks. We don't want any other family to have their hearts shattered the way that ours are. We don't want any more suffering. We know right now that Hamas is worse than ISIS. Carmela was 80. Noya was 12. <laughs> That's Noya's mom singing to her, posted just last month. And tell me about Noya. She had autism. She was sensitive to light and sound and noise. And she loved Harry Potter. Um, she dressed up like Harry Potter. She and her grandmother were deeply connected. And I think if there's any solace right now, it's to know that they are together. Do you wish for the government to punish Hamas further? I think there's a lot of talk about a proportionate response or proportional response. And no Israeli believes that that exists. Not one of us wants to go kill babies or rape women or murder people, or take people from their families. But we want to live without the fear of terrorists crossing our border and creating what we're experiencing in the last two weeks. 
Our thanks to Lester Holt for that report. Well, for more, we are joined by Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahavi. She's the founder and CEO of ALMA, an organization specializing in research and analysis of Israel's security challenges on the northern border. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much for being here. So we are definitely going to talk about that northern border. But first, if we could just start with this fact, Israel's defense minister met with IDF troops Thursday and told them they would soon see Gaza from the inside, something we've been talking about this morning. Do you see signs that Israel is really preparing to move ahead with this ground offensive at some point soon? I can't know that because I can. all I can tell is that we can see the army prepared on both borders and stretched on both borders, the north and the south. And I must say, watching your previous uh, article, that it's really very important before going to any ceasefire or humanitarian aid that the uh, hostages will be released. These hostages also are part of the humanitarian crisis, just like the Gazians. And one more thing, the, the player here that should be held responsible for all the, uh, the suffering inside Gaza, and I watch your, your photos and images from Gaza, and it's truly uh, make, make me sad, and I truly mm -hmm. identified with all the horrors there, but the player that should be held accountable is Hamas. Hamas is using his own people as human shield after he slaughtered my people. So all of us should unite together to make sure that this will not happen again. This is not September 11. This is the Nazis. And they are, we don't have a choice like Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam. We don't have a choice. This is on our other side of the border. This is fits away from our people. Also uh, within the borders of Gaza are, are these hostages, more than 200 people believed held by Hamas. In your opinion, uh, just walk us through how that potentially complicates things in terms of the military options available to the IDF in order to not jeopardize their safety? Or, or does that seem like uh, at this point losing some of the hostages may be what happens? Is the IDF prepared for that in order to be able to accomplish their military goals? I believe that our IDF prepared for that. You know, uh, we know of this kind of uh, scenario and this kind of intention by terrorist organization like from a decade ago, also from the North. So I believe IDF understands the situation and the complexity of that. Having said that, you all understand that we cannot live with the monster. And that's why IDF, IDF is uh, preparing to fight Hamas uh, and to eliminate its military capabilities. I believe that if there is specific information of uh, where the hostages are, so this is a, a place where we will act in a different way and IDF will find a way to do whatever it can. It doesn't mean that hostages will not get killed. Hamas is doing everything it can to put them at risk. Uh, we are all aware of that. I mentioned that you specialize in analyzing the security of the northern border of Israel, which, of course, has also been a concern as we've seen some military action from Hezbollah. How concerned are you about the war spreading on that front? And what are you seeing right now? I'm extremely concerned. I can tell you of my personal view that I left the north with my little girl and I begged my the rest of the family to come down south. Uh, we, when we try to analyze the attacks that we experienced up north in the past two weeks, so this, we see that in the past week there are more attacks, even though the escalation is not... Uh, you know, uh, at upscale, it's not war, but it's a war zone in a, in a sense that uh, more than 60,000 people that are living next to the border were evacuated and still being evacuated. Uh, it means that uh, there is no normality. Children are not going to school. It means that we hear all the military activity, and it means that it's not safe for anybody to be next to the border because every day something happens, whether it's anti-tanks or mortars or rockets, or even once UAVs or infiltration of terrorists into the communities. And uh, sincerely, I don't know how we are going to get back to normal unless uh, we will fight Hezbollah, because this is a true threat while these communities are based at defense of the border. That's why I've said it's not Afghanistan, it's not Iraq. Uh, this is here, just on the other side. I live 12 kilometers from the Israeli-Lebanese border, and we had conversation of how, how we protect the shelter, how we block the door, what would we do, how we go out of the window if we hear terrorists outside. I don't want to, to you know, raise my kids with these kind of conversations anymore. 
Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahabi, thank you very much, both just for a little slice of what life on the ground is like right now, but also your expertise. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank as the you. fighting continues, airstrikes are pushing Gaza's second largest hospital, which was already overflowing with patients, to the brink. Gaza journalist Akram al Sadri has the latest. It's already the 13th day of the ongoing escalation. According to the UN UCHA, Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, around one-fourth of the Gaza North has already been destroyed by the ongoing bombardment. In the Gaza South also, the bombardment continues and the destruction of the houses and the death toll increases by the minute. According to some of the information, the uh, Egyptian authorities have already started leveling the land that was affected by the bombardment and started also working and coordinating for the sake of allowing the entry of the goods of the 20 containers into the Gaza Strip. In the meantime, also, the Gaza Ministry of Health has been preparing itself to receive those goods. It looks like it is a medical aid that is allowed to enter the Gaza Strip, and it looks like that the organization that coordinated for the entry of those goods is the International Committee of the Red Cross. In the meanwhile, as I said, the bombardment continues and the hospitals continue receiving very large number of people injured. In Nasser Hospital, they have been receiving people who are injured from the morning and they still struggle for the sake of catering or for the sake of accommodating the increased number of people injured. In my, on my way here, I was seeing how they were evacuating some patients with less severe injuries, they uh, discharging them to their homes so that they can take in the other uh, injured people who might be in a much severe case and in need of a more dire need to the uh, medical uh, care. So the health system is still uh, suffering and is struggling, and there is still very challenging situation ahead of them if the medical aid has not entered Gaza today or tomorrow. Mm. Akram al Sadri, thank you so much. Stay safe. Well, Americans looking to flee the ongoing war say they are experiencing different levels of support from the Biden administration. Those stranded in Gaza say they are in a state of limbo. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra has the details. I'm happy to be back and I'm safe. In recent days, Americans have been fleeing Israel by the thousands. I have a lot of friends that are fighting, so I'm worried it's right to be with my family right now. The U.S. effort to get Americans back home has been complex, through the skies, chartering flights, and even over water. For those who made the sea journey to Cyprus, it was a vital lifeline. We're having a hard time getting out any other way. 3,000 Americans reported finding their own ways out of Israel. For many, that meant flights through those commercial airlines still flying. Major carriers like American, Delta and United, suspending flights in and out of the country. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis also launched an initiative to fly American citizens directly from Israel to Tampa. But not every American in Israel wants to come home. So far, only about half the seats offered on U.S. chartered journeys have been filled. Only 1,500 of the more than 5,000 offered airline seats were used by U.S. citizens and their families, according to the State Department. And that massive Royal Caribbean cruise ship chartered by the U.S. government set sail with only 150 50 passengers out of 2,200 spots. And for the Americans stuck in the Gaza Strip, it's been a vastly different reality. Imagine having to have all your life in a very small suitcase that hardly has enough supplies for you. Amid Israel's total siege of the territory, including a naval blockade, there's only one way out, the Rafah border, crossing with Egypt, which has been closed since October 10th. An American aid worker trying to escape tells NBC News about her state of limbo. It hasn't been the safe haven that we were promised. There's bombing, there is no water, there's no electricity, there is no fuel, hardly any food. The State Department says roughly five to 600 U.S. citizens were in the Gaza Strip before the Hamas attacks on October 7th. It says so far they've received requests for help from 350 and their families. The government has told Americans to wait near the Rafah crossing because they think if it does open to evacuees, that window might be brief. But for Palestinian Americans back in the U.S., they say the government's efforts have fallen short. What we're hearing from the State Department, the messages are at the end, good luck. Is good luck is what we're telling Americans? 
Our thanks to Marissa Parra for that report. While the war between Israel and Hamas is dividing students and faculty on college campuses across the country. This morning, students at some schools are facing serious consequences for taking a stance on the war. NBC News correspondent Jake Ward explains. Free speech is, of course, a closely held belief in the United States, and especially on university campuses, where debates and protests are a long part of the history of being there. But the conflict in Israel and Gaza seems to have pushed many students and some faculty to the breaking point. Palestine will be free. Opposing rallies at Columbia, a die-in at Harvard. The latest protests are part of a long tradition of free speech on campus. But some law students are now finding their words can affect their future. Law firm Winston & Straw announced they rescinded a job offer to a top NYU law student this month after blaming Israel for the violence on October 7th. And law firm Davis Pope pulled three more offered to Harvard students for signing a similar statement. Now, a tenured professor has written an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal entitled, Do Not Hire My Anti-Semitic Students. Free speech does not mean there's no consequences for free speech. Stephen Solomon says he considers any justification of the Hamas attacks to be anti-Semitic hate speech. This is a professional setting. These are people who are to be trained as lawyers. Um, they should not be going out as lawyers if they're advocating the murder and justifying the murder of innocent people. One Berkeley student group mentioned in the op-ed characterized the October 7th attacks as resistance to apartheid. In a statement to NBC News, the group calls the article a smear that wrongly conflates activism with anti-Semitism. Some students unaffiliated with the group say they are concerned about the op-ed's precedent. I think regardless of which side you support, I don't know that professors should be encouraging it to uh, dissuade you from potential employment. Kenneth Stern runs Bard College's Center for the Study of Hate. When you start drawing lines of saying what speech is permitted and what speech isn't, that's a horrible thing in society in general. A debate over free speech and whether a student's public stance on a controversial topic should cripple a career before it even begins. I know in Thessalonica. Now, Professor Solomon says that several law firms have come forward to applaud him for what he wrote in the Wall Street Journal and have told him that they will be acting on his recommendations. Meanwhile, fellow faculty members at UC Berkeley say that they disapprove of his position. One of them told me that she considers his use of his own free speech rights as a tenured faculty member to be inappropriate considering that he is encouraging employers to not hire students when they exercise their free speech. Back to you. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.